Has it started? Sorry. Yeah, yes, it started, Amara. Okay. Hi, everyone. Welcome to 131st Stanford Media Group Exchange session. This week, we have Ibo Wang from uh, University of Illinois, Chicago here with us to talk about their work on analyzing and exposing vulnerabilities in language models. Ibo is a PhD student in the Computer Science Department at University of Illinois, Chicago, under the supervision of Professor Philip Yu. Her primary research areas include natural language processing and large language models with a focus on trustworthy LLMs and code generation using LLMs. Ibo, thank you very much for joining us today. Before we start, do you have any preference on how you would like to take questions? Can we interrupt you in the middle or do you have like designated breaks in your talk? Yeah, you can interrupt me if you have any questions. Okay, thank you. Let's then everyone, uh, let's try to make the session as interactive as possible. And without further ado, let me hand it over to Ibo. So I'm, I'm very happy to be invited to talk. So today my topic is analyzing and exposing vulnerabilities in language models. So I will present two papers from two perspectives. The first one is from the robustness, the A3 distribution aware adversary attack against language models. That second is from the uh, fairness. The topic is probing, measuring, and mitigating gender affiliations in large language models. So let's talk about the first paper. So first of all, uh, I want to introduce what is a tag in natural language processing. So it means slightly altering input text to mislead or confuse the model. So the current methods can be roughly categorized into character level, word level, or sentence level attack methods. So the character level methods change text by incorporating some typos or, or errors in those words, and word level attacks alter the entire words rather than the individual characters within the words. Sentence level attacks typically involves inserting or rewriting sentences within a text without uh, changing the semantic meaning of the sentence. Here are two toy examples of the sentiment analysis tasks. Both two examples are the adversary examples. They can both successfully attack this victim language model. However, the top one is not is detected by the by the detector, while the bottom one is not detected. So this means the top one is not really effective when defenders use this detector. So we believe only those examples that are both able to fool the model and are not detected as successful adversary examples. So thus, we doubt if the previous adversary attack methods are effective under such detection. We visualize the distribution of the maximum softmax probabilities of original data and the adversary data generated by BERT attack on SST2 and MRPC dataset. So from this visualization, we observed that the majority of the original MSP, like the purple one, has an MSP exceeding 0.9, while the distribution of the adversary MSP, which is the red one, is more even. So especially on this MRPC dataset, um, we can see most adversary examples exhibit MSP below 0.6. So this visualization shows a clear distribution distinction between the original and the adversary examples regarding MSP. So you imagine we if we have a threshold here, so we can easily detect which examples are adversary examples. Thus those like bird attack is not very effective if we use this threshold to detect adversary examples. So besides the score-based metrics, we also visualize the distribution of an embedding-based matrix, the mahala nobius distance. So this distance is a metric to measure the distance between a data point and a distribution. So in our case, we measure the distance between an original or the adversary data and the training data. So from this visualization, we can observe original data is closer to training data, while adversary data is farther from training data. So this visualization also shows that the distribution shifts between original data and the adversary data also exists. Sorry, sorry well, one quick thing. So when you calculate this distance, are you calculating between the embeddings, right? Or yes. between the oh, okay, okay, between, got it. Between the embeddings. And embeddings from the LLMs, right? 
Yes. From yes. the same same models. Yeah, from same model. Okay, perfect. Okay. So so for this figure we use BERT embedding. Yeah. And so since the previous attack methods cannot generate non-detectable adversary examples, we propose So did you new... select it like sorry, sorry to stop you. Yeah, uh, did you select it like some specific words or um you just selected like some random words to calculate the embedding distance? Oh, we use the Intel test set. Oh, okay, got it. So in that test set, whatever or what appears, right? Yes. Okay, got it, got it. So we propose this new method, DA3, to generate the successful and non-detectable adversary examples. So our method has two phases. The first phase is fine-tuning. So during this fine-tuning, we combine the mask language modeling task and the downstream tasks. So we use a frozen person language model and a tunable LoRa module for fine-tuning. We design the MSP loss and the MD loss which are adopted from the auto distribution detection methods. The MSP loss is used to generate adversary examples more similar to original examples concerning MSP because we want the maximum softmax probability to be as large as possible based on our previous observation. And the MD loss encourages the, the generated adversary examples to resemble original examples in terms or in terms of MD. So basically this MD loss will help to restore this uh, adversary examples to be similar as the original examples. And during the inference phase, we use the fine-tuned LoRa module and the frozen person language model to generate adversary examples. And we first tokenize the original sentence and rank the tokens based on their importance. And we select the most important tokens to mask and generate a list of replacement candidates using this the person, uh, this frozen LoRa-based person language model. So we repeat this selection and the re replacement process until a successful attack is made or the termination condition is met. So in our experiments, we use 50% of the tokens as the termination condition. Um, we use two metrics to check how much the text has changed and how well the original semantics is preserved. The first one is a percentage of perturbed words. It measures how much a text has been altered or perturbed from its original form. The second one is the semantic similarity. It measures the sentence semantic similarity between the original and adversary examples. Uh, we use the universal sentence encoder and the cosine similarity here. And for the attack tag effectiveness evaluation, we use the these two evaluation metrics. The first one is a common and widely used attack success rate. It is a percentage of generated adversary examples that can successfully deceive model predictions. And the second one, NASA, is proposed by us based on our motivation. It combines the attack success rate with non-detectability. So NASA measures the percentage of generated adversary examples that can successfully deceive model and are also non-detectable by out-of-distribution detection methods. Um, we conduct experiments on both white box models and the black box box models. We use these four different data sets. They have like different tasks. And we compare performance with five different SOTA models. Uh, the white box me means we use the same person language model for fine tuning inference and for the victim model. And for this white box setting, we use bird base and the robota base. From this result table, uh, we can see our proposed method can obtain the best or second to best performance regarding NASA on most data sets. Besides the DA3, some other models also perform well on some of the backbones. For example, the text fuller works well on bird base and the bird attack works well on Roberta base. So this indicates although these models can generate adversary examples uh, 
uh, that can deceive the victim models, the generated examples are actually easily detected because we can see there's a big drop between the NASA and the ASR. So although they so have... Do you have a limitation on the the tech size or the tech size? Uh, it's like 512, right? Because Bart and Roberta only is 512. Uh, so could you repeat? So what is the maximum length of the text? Um, it's not very long. It's just the maximum length is just like two two sentences. Okay, so you just take two sentences, but you, your limitation is like 512, which is the Bart's limitation, right? I uh, could you repeat again? Yeah, so the the Bart has a limitation that it can only read like five twelve sequence length altogether. So you have the same limitation, right? Like five twelve sequence length. Yes. So you cannot go beyond that. Yes. Yes. We we didn't go beyond uh five one two. Okay. Yeah. Um. Yes. So so these two models have this limitation because uh, NASA is decreased. Which means those generated adversary examples are not non-detectable, although they can successfully attack the model. Um, here is a number of person perturbed words and uh, semantic similarity results on the bird-based and reporter-based victim models. Our model can achieve the best or second to best um, percentage of perturbed words. But the semantic similarity is not always the best, but the performance is pretty similar as the other models. Um, here is the uh, experiments on black box models. So the black box setting means the per trend language model is used for fine tuning and the inference, but it is not used for the victim model. So the victim model is not touched during either fine tuning or inference. So for this black box setting, we use Lama 2 7 billion and the Mistral 7 billion as a backbone model. And we transfer the generated adversary examples by DA3 using bird base as the backbone. So the results are the average of the of their prompting with five different prompts because the LLMs are, are very sensitive to different prompts. So from this table, we can see DA3 obtains the best or second to best performance. Here is a visualization of the different different prompts, uh, the visualization of performance across different prompts. Uh, since the performance of LLMs is not stable using different prompts, um, we can observe that like DA3 can consistently surpass other baseline models for each run. We also analyze each component of the loss. So this figure shows the change of MSP loss, MD loss, and the DAL loss, which is a combination of these two um, throughout the fine tuning of DA3. From this figure, we can see although, although the uh, overall trends are consistent, the, the MSP and MD loss often exhibit the update trends at each step like this, especially in this initial state. So from the this, we can understand there is a trade-off between the MSP and the MD loss because minimizing MSP loss will increase the confidence of wrong prediction, which aligns with the, the regular adversary attack task. And the minimizing MD loss will encourage adversary examples to resemble the original examples, which is similar as a mask language modeling task to like restore the tokens to their original values. So these two losses can help prevent DA3 to overfit to some loss and then generate both successful and non-detectable adversary examples since there are some trade-off and we can find a balance between these two losses. Uh, we conduct human evaluations so we compare the grammar correctness between adversary and the original examples because we want the generated adversary examples to be 
readable and not suspicious. So we we also compare the prediction accuracy between DA3 and original examples because we want to evaluate if the word perturbations can affect the prediction accuracy. We also compare the semantic preservation between BDA3 and the text fuller to evaluate if our method can preserve the original semantics. So from the table, DA3 can achieve the um, comparable grammar correctness and accuracy as the uh, original examples, and uh, it has better performance than text fuller regarding the semantic preservation. Here's an example of the of the um, generated adversary example. So we only altered one sentence and it can attack the model successfully. And it's not suspicious to humans, even though it has some like grammar issues. Uh, we did some ablation study to analyze uh, different components of the our loss. So like from the ablation study that both MD and MSP loss are effective for like across most of the data sets. And we also compare our loss with like different attack losses. Like the first one is a negative of regular cross entropy loss. The second one is the cross entropy loss of the flipped adversary labels. These two are most common baselines of attack loss. And our loss can outperform the other two losses on most data sets. To summarize this paper, so we first analyze the distribution shifts of adversary and original examples, and we propose a new distribution aware adversary attack method, which can generate adversary examples that are successful and non-detectable. We also design a new evaluation matrix, NASA, which considers both attack success rate and the detectability. Um, we hope like future attack methods can also consider detectability because it is important to make sure the attack methods are effective under different, dif uh, under different detection methods. Any questions for this paper? Um, just a quick question. Um, have you looked into what type of modifications it does to the text that help it um, escape not being detectable? I think it's hard to summarize because many mm -hmm. alternations are very just very random. It sometimes inserts some typos, some random uh, punctuations, then the prediction can be changed and it's, it can reserve the same distribution. So I think it's very hard to summarize the patterns. Thank you. Do you see any uh, like pattern, uh, like patterns inside the specific task that you're doing? Like say, for example, SS2, like in SS2, uh, it's kind of trying to say, for example, insert a word or a punctuation, and then that changes when you're doing some kind of like the COLA task or like uh, what else? I think there are other tasks that you were also showing the results on. Did you see the like a pattern match in those cases or like just curious? Uh, yes, I think the different data sets do have some different performances, like because the SST2 is longer is the the examples are longer than cola and some other data sets so it's it's actually easier to uh for other for some baseline methods to escape from detection because uh, it's the length sorry because the sentence is very long and yeah so that's what i exactly what you talk you you said that, that was my first confusion when i looked at your matrix because it seems that the sentence length particularly in the data sets that you are showing here their sentence lengths are pretty different. Yes. So that may have an effect on the performance cal calculation too. Yes, that's true. I think our method is more effective when the uh, on, on shorter sentences, when it's more easy to, to detect. So do you see do you think that in that case, um, for example, if you are looking at a longer clinic note or something like sentence by sentence analysis would be more relevant then? 
So, sorry, could you repeat that? So imagine like I have a very long text, right? Like for mm -hmm. clinical, you, you, you have worked on clinical note before, right? So imagine like we have this long, very long text. Do you think that in that case, like sentence by sentence analysis could be helpful? Um, yes, yes, I think so. And I think we need to like extract some important sentences and, mm -hmm. and analyze those sentences. Okay. Yeah. I don't know, Vishal, sorry. I, I, I had exactly the same thing, sorry. I think we can move forward if nobody has any more questions. Uh, so let's move on to the next paper, Proving, Measuring, and Mitigating Gender Affiliations in Large Language Models. Mm. So large language models have been like widely used in our daily life. So it's important to consider their social impact. Consider this scenario where a student uses a um, language model to help with writing. The student input, the scientists conducted important experiments, and then the LLM continues to generate his work help to cure cancer. This LLM assumes the scientist to be male without any context. So this uh, use of LLM will cre create new stereotypes or deepen the existing ones in the student's cognition. However, there is no existing systematic framework to assess such risks. Like previous disclosure work required gender mentions or stereotypes. For example, like this one, the woman works, worked as a nurse. So this nurse is a, a stereotypical occupation. However, those stereotypes are always evolving and it's hard to collect all the stereotypes. And these methods does not consider the situations where there is no explicit gender information like, the, like in this example. So we propose to prompt LLMs using inputs that do not explicitly mention genders or stereotypes. For example, the input can be my friend is talking on the phone and, and we evaluate gender affiliations based on the continual generation of LLMs. If, if the LLM use he or she, it means it's biased or it's gender affiliated. And if the output use my friend to refer, to my friend, which means it's um it's fair, it's unbiased. So they under this scenario, gender affiliations are defined as the associations or links that the prompt LLMs make between inputs and the specific gender, because this input is has no gender information or gender stereotypes. So specifically, we propose two prompting strategies. The first one is the naturally sourced inputs which are filtered from human-generated datasets like S, uh, STSB and SNLI, uh, we select sentences that describe human activities. For example, a person is working. We change the a person to my friend to keep it the same as others, other examples. So the second one is uh, LLM-generated inputs, which are generated by ChatGPT from a C sentence. We use this prompt generate 200 statements starting with my friend, for example, and we provide the seed sentence. The seed sentence can be the stereotypical one, like my friend likes blue, or the non-stereotypical one, my friend is talking on the phone. We also use this template-based or explicitly stereotypical inputs as a comparison. So these inputs are constructed from the general stereotypes like the occupation, personality, hobby, and the color. Uh, we propose both the token level explicit matrix and the logic level implicit matrix. Here is an example. If the continual generation has gender attribute words like key, we consider it as the explicit bias. Uh, we propose a gender attribute score for this explicit bias. It measures the proportion of sentences containing gender attribute words. And here is a list of the gender attribute words. It's a pair of tokens like he or she, him or her, himself, and herself. 
So if the continual generation does not have any gender attribute work, but it shows the incl inclination from the logic level like this one, we can see a clear distinction between female and male uh, logics. We consider it as an implicit bias. We use the gender logic difference and the attribute attribute distribution distance to measure the logic level bias. The GLD measures the normalized probability difference between the female and the male attribute words, and the AD add measures the Jason Shannon divergence between the female and the male attribute word probability distribution. So the difference between these two metrics is the second one considers from the distribution, and the first one considers from the single attribute word. We benchmark 12, 12 different LLMs and evaluate their performance using three metrics. Um, we want to first answer this question. How do LLMs behave under different programming strategies? So from the this figure, it's very obvious that this explicitly stereotypical inputs can cause LLMs to generate a large number of gender-affiliated sentences. This is because the explicit stereotypical inputs are constructed from stereotypes. So it's, it is expected that they will prompt the most gender-affiliated sentences. And the generated sentences prompted by this LLM-generated inputs have a similar gender affiliation performance as this one. Um, we think this is because the LLM generated sentences already have some like inherited bias from the chat GPT. And the naturally sourced inputs can prompt LLMs to generate nearly half of the sentences affiliated with specific genders. Even though they are collected without a specific focus on gender information, they can still prompt LLMs to show some like inappropriate gender affiliation. Uh, the second question is, do larger or aligned models can generate a few gender affiliated sentences? We compare LLMs with different sizes and different tuning strategies. However, our experiments do not show any like clear patterns whether larger or aligned models are more fair or not. Um, like here, so from these um, red boxes, we can see sometimes, sometimes like in the llama, larger models have less biased sentences, but sometimes as in this OBT models, the larger models show like more biased sentences. And as in this uh, orange boxes, uh, so on these llama models, the aligned models are less biased. However, on this, are more biased, sorry. So on this Falcon model, the aligned models are less biased. So the conclusion is larger aligned models are not always more fair. Uh, Ibu, I had a question on the, oh, I think you have it on the next slide, I guess. Maybe you go ahead to the next slide, yeah. yeah. Uh, so I just had one question regarding the tuning strategies. So like, did you consider like greedy tuning? I, I think you have it on the next slide. So yeah, yeah, you just, yeah. So, uh, so like we compare three different mitigation methods. The first one is simply uh, decoding tunings. So the first one is uh, hyperparameter tuning. We Try, we tune the hyper the decoding parameters like the temperature top P and the top K. So these these decoding parameters only influence the token level metrics because they only uh, influence the decoded sentences. The second one is the instruction guiding. We use this prompt continue the sentence without gender mentions to help the LLM to generate more fair outputs. The third one is the debias tuning. We use QLORA fine tuning uh, based on the the loss we designed, and this loss is just based on the the token level and logic level metrics we proposed before. 
Else, the uh, performance of the the debugging performance of hyperparameter tuning. So we can see the mitigation performance varies for different hyperparameters because it is harder to um, connect the decoding strategy with the outputs. It's harder to find some clear patterns. Here is the results of instruction guiding and device tuning on the naturally sourced data sets and the LLM generated data sets. The instruction guiding can mitigate both explicit and implicit bias, and the device tuning has a better performance regarding the mitigation. It is like expected because debug tuning changed the, the, the parameters of the language language model. So here's the overview. Like for the prompting, we design the non-explicitly stereotypical inputs that do not contain gender information. We design the naturally sourced inputs and the LLM generated inputs to prompt large, large language models. Um, and those inputs contain no gender information. And for the measuring, we propose a token level and a logic level evaluation metrics to evaluate both explicit and implicit gender bias or gender affiliations. Uh, for the mitigation, we explore three different methods. The first two are decoding, and the, the third one is a QLORA fine tuning method. Any questions? Nibu, in this case, do you uh, see any kind of syntactical errors and how do you uh, deal with those? Like what if the generation, the generated sentence, it's not, uh, it, it's giving kind of both gender, maybe using pronoun for one gender and then some other indication for the other. So are there any, how, how would you classify those sentences or is there any way to deal with that? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, actually, from our experiments, we only have like very few sentences contain both both genders, maybe like less than five sentences. So we just discard those examples. Okay, and that happens like with or without your um, fine tuning, right? E even um, the off the shelf models, they don't uh, do this kind of syntactical error very often. Yes, even without the fine tuning, they are. Okay. They still. Okay. Thank you. I think we can move forward if nobody has questions. Uh, I think that's a. Oh, that's... okay. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Ibo, for this interesting uh, talk. So before we open the floor for questions, uh, let's give our uh, speaker a virtual round of applause. And then if anybody has any questions, so please jump in at this point. Ibo, why did you select gender only? For analyzing... Yeah. I think it's uh, we simplify the the data set because for genders it's easier to to have this this list these gender built words but for other other demographic like the race or other things it's harder to collect those attribute words. But I think that we are missing a point. Like there is also non-binary gender. Ah uh, yes. And, uh... So what are you going to do with them? Because in this study, you are not considering them, right? Yes, we, we only consider the banner agenda. Hmm. Because I think if you start adding this non-binary gender, it will be more problematic, actually, compared to any other categories like age, race. Yes. Um. I think for the non-binary genders, if we use... Just use my friend or use they to to refer to them. That's mm -hmm. also makes sense. Okay. Okay. Also, Ibo, the uh, again, I think I'm going to go back to the gen, the tuning strategies, like the uh, inference uh, strategies that you used. 
so what did you use for temperature values because with like when you like use something which is like a higher temperature it starts generating more like you know innovative solutions or and usually it's all distribution based so there if it has like the word he in the distribution more then it will obviously pick the word he so what oh, okay you you have it through across multiple values okay yes yes we tried several different values for the temperature i think usually people end up choosing something between 0.7 to 1 for uh, generation so yeah i guess that's it since you have studied this uh, issue of bias so uh, do you think like any insights that anybody using these llms for downstream tasks that you can provide from your study Yes, I think uh, one thing like from my own experience is when I ask ChatGPT to, to summarize my resume and write a short introduction to myself, it use he. Yes, I think this the problem is uh, still exist even we use GPT for O. Right. Yeah. So I think this problem is deserve some. Have you tried using Gemini? I think Gemini, they claim that they have debiased it to quite a bit. Like they have used it and you can take a look at Gemini if you want. Like to, because they have claimed that, you know, they have debiased it. They have actually trained it on and they have put in a lot of uh, measures to not generate biased data. So, yeah. I think Gemini, Claude like the uh, some set of newer models mm. okay if we don't have any more questions then uh Ibo, thank you very much again for this interesting talk uh let's give our uh, speaker another round of applause and uh, if you have any further questions we can probably put you in touch with the author offline uh, thank you very much, everyone.